Testing audio. Check. One, two, three. Check. One, two, three. Testing audio. Good morning. morning. Happy New Year. Can I get a Happy New Year? Year. Thank you very much. And Happy New Year also to everyone who's tuning in online uh, today. I don't know if it seems like the new year, but today is the new year of the church year. The season of Advent begins our church year after Thanksgiving which isn't technically on the church year calendar, but we do celebrate that. It's it's a worthy holiday. Advent then begins, and uh, we'll hear more about the Advent season as the the season progresses and everything. We have the first candle lit on our Advent wreath. That's called the prophecy candle. And we remember today the the many prophecies that God uh, revealed in the Old Testament about the Savior who would be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, who would be a mighty prophet, and who would also be the willing servant and many more. And uh, we'll light one candle each week, of course, as uh, the season progresses. In our service today, uh, we're going to follow the, the one that uh, is printed out, also was emailed out to, to people in our congregation upon request. And it opens each week with a gathering song called Come Lord Jesus. Now we did this song uh, two years ago at the beginning of our Advent services. We're going to use it again. You're invited to to sing the refrain in the box every time it comes up, even right from the beginning. If it doesn't sound familiar, I'll be singing with you and and we'll be reminded. I'll sing the verses uh, that are in between. And then uh, on page four in the bulletin, if you turn the page... uh, The confession and absolution is done as the music is in the background, so don't let that distract you, but but rather kind of amplify our our confession and absolution uh, today. God bless us as we begin our Advent season now, as we await our, our Savior.
Advent season, as we await the coming of Jesus, we must admit our sinfulness. We have disobeyed the Lord and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength now to live according to his will. Amen. your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We now turn to our scripture readings today, and we have two readings that are background for the sermon message today. The first reading is from Genesis 27, selected verses. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebecca, that is Isaac's wife, was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say this to your brother Esau. Now my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him, and would bring down a curse on myself, rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, 
My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered. Your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her young son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading today is from Genesis chapter 31. This is when Jacob is returning to the promised land many years later. Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he was running away. So he fled with all he had, and crossing the river, he headed for the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You deceived me, and you've carried off my daughters like captives of war. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you. But last night the God of your father said to me, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, If you find anyone who has your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me, and if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maidservants, but he found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them inside her camel's saddle and was sitting on them. Laban searched through everything in the tent but found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So he searched, but he could not find the household gods. This also is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Before we sing the second hymn, I'll offer a children's devotion uh, for those online. And uh, for those children here today, you can just remain seated where you are. For our children's devotion today, I need to show you my shirt. My shirt is a vivid color. My shirt and my tie are both the same color. Of course, you know that's the color blue. And it's kind of an azure blue or a kind of a deep blue. It's not a sky blue and it's not a navy blue. Rather kind of a deep blue. And you notice our three candles are also blue. We use the color blue for Advent. Why would we do that? You know, kids, I've mentioned this before, and maybe you have an idea. If we don't know why we use blue for Advent, I guess maybe we shouldn't use it. We probably should be informed on that. But blue is the color, not of the sky right now. It's kind of lighter and it's brighter out right now. But it's the color of the early morning sky when it's a little deeper and a little bit darker. And blue is also considered the color of hope. Hope. <coughs> Why would we look at the dawn of a new day and the color of hope during Advent? The reason is because in four weeks from now, we're going to commemorate the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus as he is born once again in Bethlehem and we commemorate his birth. But you know, Advent is more than about just Jesus' birth coming. The word Advent means coming and looks forward to the coming of Jesus again at the end of time. He will be coming again and he will be bringing blessings. You know, at Christmas we have blessings that we can think ahead to with this birth. This is the Savior who's come. He's going to live for us. He's going to die on a cross for our sins. And as we think of the end of time, Jesus is going to bring about our final redemption. A new day, the dawn of a new day in eternal life in heaven forever. So when you look at that wreath or you look around, you see if someone's wearing a shirt or a coat that's blue, think Advent. A new day in Jesus that we look forward to, not only at Christmas, but forever. We bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you do bring a new day of blessings. You do bring hope. As we look ahead to your birth, help our Advent season be one of expectation, anticipation, and reflection. And help us also know you will come at the end of time with eternal blessings that we will experience forever with you in heaven. Amen. We'll sing the hymn, uh, hymn one together today. That's in the back of your bulletin. It's on page 12.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. What do the following people have in common? President Gerald Ford, John Legend, Bill Clinton, Calamity Jane, Shania Twain, Mark Twain, Judy Garland, Stevie Wonder, and Sting. What do all of those people have in common? All of those people have had their names changed. Those are not their given names. Some of them have had their names changed just a, a little bit. Some of them have had their names completely changed. I would submit to you today that changing your name is a big thing. It's a big thing. I mean, you're not just changing some little detail in your life, some habit or something you like or something you buy. It, you're changing your name. You're changing your given name that someone originally gave you. I would say that's no small thing. As you think about that concept, that's going to be the concept that we're going to look at today as we begin Advent with this first sermon in a series. Our Advent Sunday series is called Let's Go to Bethlehem. And as we do that, we're going to look at some people in the Bible who lived at Bethlehem long before Jesus was ever born there. And we're going to learn some lessons from what happened in their life or the, the incident that comes up. Today, we're looking at a name change. And it's going to be a significant name change. So as we look into this uh, text today, let's bow our heads and pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Listen to the words of Genesis chapter 35, our sermon text. God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him, from the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar in the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him, Bethel. Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. This is the word of the Lord. Our service theme is going to take us to Bethlehem. Maybe a couple words about Bethlehem before we look at this account specifically. Bethlehem doesn't seem to have been a happening place in the Bible. There's not a lot of accounts that we have in the Bible, but I, I'll bet if you ask anyone almost in this country what happened at Bethlehem, they would know. That's where Jesus Christ was born. It's a very well-known place today, world over. People know Bethlehem was the place of Jesus' birth. But not a happening place, it seems. In fact, the few accounts that we're going to look at in this sermon series, this Advent, are the, really the only accounts of any substance at all that happened near or around that little town. What was happening around Bethlehem at this time? Well, the context of these verses is that Jacob was returning back to his homeland. He had been gone for quite a while. We read the first reading today to show you why he had left. He had fled from his brother Esau who wanted to kill him. And as he fled north, many, many, many miles out of the country, he fled to his mother's brother, Laban. And there Laban had taken him in. Laban had started him out with flocks and herds. Laban had even given him Rachel his daughter in marriage, and Jacob had spent 20 years 
up there working for and with Laban. At this time, though, Jacob had wanted to come back. He didn't think Laban would be so excited to let him go, and so he left discreetly, didn't tell anybody, just left. And now he is back in the Promised Land. And he is traveling south through the Promised Land to a place where he intends to settle, probably where his father Abraham and father, grandfather Abraham and father Isaac had been in the south part of the land. And he is traveling very near Ephrath, or the place where Bethlehem was. There's a sad situation that happens at the end of our reading. Rachel is giving birth while on their journey. And as Rachel gives birth, she is having a difficult time of it. Her labor is severe. It is dangerous. It is dire. And to encourage her in the birth process, the midwife says, you, you have a son, another son. She, she had the first son already born, whose name was Joseph. And this was now Benjamin, who would eventually be. But she doesn't name her son Benjamin. But as she breathes her last, for that would be where she would die, she names him Ben-Oni. That name is significant. Ben means son in Hebrew. Bane, literally. Oni, trouble. Oni, especially my trouble. Son of my trouble. Affliction. Sorrow. Distress. It can even mean wickedness. Son of my trouble. And then she dies. And we might ask the question, why did Rachel have to die? Why would she have to die? What a sad account this is. Well, in general, we can't read the mind of God, but we know why death comes into this world. We know that none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And that's because of our first parents who ushered sin into this world. The effect of that is sorrow, trouble, toil, sickness, viruses, and death. Rachel lived in that sinful world just as we do. So we can't be surprised that she breathed her last. But we can't even look at her life and see how sin had affected her life in a couple places in these readings. What had been her folly and her sin? That's why we read the second reading today. There we have the inexplicable account of Rachel bringing false gods on the trip back home. How could this happen in Jacob's family? How could this happen with the one who was the deceiver but had a charmed life that God seemed to bless all along the way? Rachel takes the household gods. And not only that, they're not her gods. They're her father Laban's gods. And she stole them. So she went to the safety deposit box before their trip and took some valuable things to him. And then we have the kind of graphic account of how she lied about them. Sat on them. He searched her tent. Sorry, I can't move. The graphic account, graphic details, lied to her father's face that she did not take his household gods. And I'm sure there were many more incidents that happened in Rachel's life that would have clearly shown she lived under the curse of sin and its effects and had a sinful nature as much as any of us. You know, it's no surprise in Jacob's life either. That's why we read that first account. Why would death be in the world? Why would it come upon this family? Well, look, look at Jacob's life as well. Everyone in that family knew that he was supposed to get that blessing, despite the fact that Esau was the firstborn. He knew it. His brother knew it. His parents knew it. But he wasn't supposed to steal it either. And he wasn't supposed to take it like he did. He tricked his father, lied to his face, took his brother's blessing, scooted out the door. Jacob had that shadow of sin over his life as well. And not only that, but we could look at his family dynamics. Rachel wasn't his only wife. Well, Laban had tricked Jacob and had given him Leah, the older one that Jacob hadn't wanted as his wife. But no problem. Jacob said, I'll work a little longer. I'll take two wives. I'll take Rachel too. And he did. Not only that, but he also took their handmaidens. And through them, he fathered 12 sons and one daughter. 
No, Jacob had his deception and his sins as well. This is no surprise that he had this come upon his family. You know, in essence, the point is, Rachel named her son Ben-Oni, son of my wickedness, my sorrow, my trouble, my distress. Jacob was Ben-Oni by nature. Rachel was daughter of Oni, daughter of trouble in the Lord's eyes as well. How about you? Are you a son of trouble? Are you a daughter of sin and trouble? Could we be called Ben-Oni by nature? What has been your trouble, distress, and sins? What has been your garbage before the Lord? You know, if you look at it like garbage, I, I read about a news account in the past about a house in Nevada, Carson City, Nevada, that had a lot of trouble and a lot of garbage. There was a news account of a mother who kept a distressing house there. It happened in Carson City where a Child Protective Services deputy had to get involved. And in this news story, it says that once he was in the residence, he said he could smell trash, sour food, and animal waste. There were bags of trash broken open and spilling on the floor. In the kitchen, there were clothes that were two feet high, dirty dishes and moldy food spilling out of the sink, trash on the kitchen counter and tables, the laundry room door could not be opened because the trash was so thick. The mother's bedroom door could not be opened and you could not see the floor. When you walked in the room, you walked on trash. And the woman was jailed. She was jailed on charges of child neglect and abuse. A trashy house. What does your house look like? What does our house as Ben Oni look like? What have your sins been like? If we could compare them to trash and accumulating in a house, what would your house look like? How about just with the sins that we see with Rachel and Jacob today? How about if we just take your sins of lying and deceit in your life? How about sins of disrespect of authority when they come looking for something? How about sins of stealing? Have you stolen and then lied about it on top of it? How about your idolatry? Have you had your household gods throughout your life? What about when you were younger? What about now? What are you tempted to idolize and put in front of God? How about your sins of immorality? Taking a couple handmaids in your life down through the years. What dumb, senseless, shameful things have you done motivated by your sinful nature? What does your house look like, Ben Oni? If we think about it, I, I don't think we want those accounts read. In fact, how would we feel if we had those recorded in the Bible for other people to learn from? I don't think anyone would want that because we have been under God's wrath as well. Sons and daughters of trouble. But then we hear about a name change. And we hear about it in this account as well. Jacob didn't want his son to be Ben-Oni throughout his life. How can you imagine having a name like that wherever you go? But he named him Benjamin, or Benjamin, son of my right hand. That's kind of an honored position, a position of strength, a position of privilege. Benjamin. And that kind of is similar to how Jacob himself had had a name change. And Jacob himself had had his journey before God changed from Ben-Oni to Benjamin as well. We see it in the promises that are at the beginning of this reading. At the beginning it said, the Lord said to, to Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. And then God went up from him. God had amazing grace and amazing promises for Jacob at that time. Amazing things. And they had been repeated. You might be familiar with the account of Jacob with the stairway to heaven. Do you remember when he was fleeing the land and he laid his head on a rock and God opened up heaven and showed him a stairway to heaven? God had repeated those blessings that he had given to Abraham, his grandfather. I will be with you. I will bring you back. I will give you this land and more. Here God says that great nation will come through your body. Royalty will come through your body. 
This land will be yours, just like I had promised. And there were more promises that he had through his father, grandfather Abraham. That Savior, through whom all nations would be blessed, would come from him too. That Savior he could look forward to, who would come on a mission of salvation. In fact, do you know that Jacob referred to that Savior when he blessed his son, who was going to get that messianic promise in the line? In Genesis 49, it says to Judah, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. That's the Messiah. And that Messiah would be born very near where Jacob and Rachel were on that day. Bethlehem. They were not far from that location where the Savior would be born and he would live for Jacob and Rachel with his perfect substitutionary life, never committing sins of lying and deceit, immorality and trickery or idolatry, and where he would lay down his life on a cross for Jacob's sins. Jacob himself had been changed by God from Ben-Oni to Benjamin. Son of God's right hand only through Jesus Christ. Rachel also could know that Savior and that forgiveness. Through the eyes of faith, she could know those promises of the Savior born for her as well, who would live for her and die for her, and through whom she could be forgiven. And it's also interesting that God used Rachel's name as a prophecy in the Old Testament that's pretty memorable. What grace God would even refer to her again. But in Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, this is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. That promise that we hear post-Christmas was originally spoken about the exiles. A sermon back, I, I talked about the exile to Babylon. As those exiles were being gathered at Ramah to be deported in chains, Jeremiah referred to Rachel and said, I can hear Rachel crying for her children right now, not being comforted because they're going far away. And ultimately, that verse is quoted again in Matthew chapter 2, where King Herod puts to death those baby boys around Bethlehem. The slaughter of the innocents and his, his paranoia to try to track down that newborn king. And Matthew quotes it and says, This is the ultimate fulfillment of Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. What grace that, that God would use her with a prophecy as, as dastardly as it was. If we think about the grace and forgiveness that made Jacob and Rachel into Benjamins, we can look at our own lives and take comfort too. Your name's been changed. You're not Ben-Oni. You are Benjamin as well. What grace to you, because God has cleaned up your trash and, and cleaned up your house. I, I don't know if you've ever cleaned up a house that's been a little bit of a hoarding house, a bit of a dirty house. What cleaning products would you bring? What cleaning products would you use? You probably have your, your stack, your trays, your bins, and bring it all in and clean it up. Well, God came to your house and he brought all of that. He brought the blood of Jesus. And he has cleaned you up, placed you at his right hand, said, you are Benjamin, not Ben-Oni anymore, but your name is written in the book of life. And we can see in Revelation what happens to people whose names are written there. Revelation 3 says, he who overcomes will be dressed in white. I will never blot his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Your new name is written in that book of life never to be erased. Finally today, we, we can look at Jacob's reaction to all of that. He set up a big pillar of a stone, poured out a drink offering on it, poured oil on it, named the place Bethel, house of God, Bethel, special place. He worshiped the Lord and praised him. This is what we do. And this Advent season, we're going to have many chances to do that. It's a natural reaction that we, we're moved to do as well. In this Advent season, we even have two opportunities to worship the Lord each week. On Sundays, we're going to go to Bethlehem 
We're going to see some famous incidents that happen. We're going to sing these Advent songs and some early Christmas songs. And on Wednesday nights, we also offer a Vesper service. Uh, due to our circumstances right now being in the evening, it'll just be online, but we'll offer a half-hour Vesper service Wednesday nights with a different series to, once again, focus us and keep us centered during this busy season. As we do that, may God bless us. And may he give us comfort every day. Not living in the sorrow and the dread of Ben Oni, but knowing you are Ben Jamen, changed by the grace of God, changed by your Savior, and changed as we wait for the eternal life, the dawning of a new day that Jesus will bring. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. We'll confess our faith on the top of page 9 with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Once again, we're not collecting a formal offering and passing plates, but there is an offering plate on the right side here if you'd like to leave an offering at our worship service. Or offerings, as always, can be mailed in if uh, you would like to do that. Therefore, let's continue with our prayers today. In our prayers, we'd like to offer a, a special prayer for our daughter, Rachel, and her new husband, uh, Eli Steinbrenner. Uh, they were united in marriage this past week in, in Wisconsin. Heavenly Father, on this first Sunday of Advent, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whom you so graciously sent to earth and offered as the lamb of sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for demonstrating God's love to us by coming as our brother to die for our sins on the cross. This Advent season, as we return in spirit to Bethlehem's stable, where you first appeared in human flesh to be our Savior, give us your grace to rededicate ourselves in our thoughts, words, and actions to you. We thank and praise you that you have made us sons and daughters of trouble, sons and daughters of your right hand. Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the faith of, of John the Baptist, who believed and confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Give us true joy and peace in knowing and believing this message this Advent season. Also, Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have established marriage for our good and commanded us to honor this holy estate. We ask for your blessing on Rachel and Eli as they enter marriage. We thank you that you were present to witness their vows of mutual faithfulness and love, that they may begin their wedded life with you. Help them always to remember with thankfulness that you have united them. Dwell in their hearts and in the home that they are establishing so that their lives and their marriage will glorify you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear us also as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We sing the hymn that's on page 13. Please be seated.
stand now for our closing prayers today? We pray on page 10. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. standing, remain standing as we close with hymn 12 on page 14. seated. Good morning again. Uh, welcome to worship service here uh, today. We're taking it week by week, taking it as it comes, making the best plan that we can. Uh, glad you could join us here uh, for worship and we'll continue to stream it online of course for those who would uh, prefer to watch it at home. A couple announcements uh, today. First of all there's the blue sheet that's uh, in the bulletin of course. Uh, check that out to stay up on what's happening around church. We're transitioning from having an information table to putting things back in your mailboxes. So we still have the information table out there. In fact, the, the Synod Magazine, the new one for December is there. Please take your copy along. There's a new meditation devotion booklet that our Synod provided. That's over there as well. In your boxes today, as we transition, is your December newsletter. Please make sure you go in and pick up your newsletter. Lots of information on what's going on. And there's also, Martin Luther College also provided us an Advent devotion book for each day of Advent. Very good, very well written by the faculty and pastors on staff there. That's in your mailbox as well. So go take those items. I think your envelopes for 2021 are in there as well. And uh, we're going to look to put more stuff in there. And once again, we have Advent Wednesdays. So Wednesday at 6.30, we'll have our Vesper service online. It'll be about a half hour or so. And uh, you can check that out. Um, if uh, we are permitted to uh, have inside gatherings uh, once again, uh, we'll, we'll let, the, let that be known and we'll uh, be able to have that as well. But uh, may that be a blessing to you this Advent season as we uh, worship with our midweek services again. Any other announcements we should know? God's blessings on your new week of grace. <laughs>
Three. Can I help you with something, uh, Jeff? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Okay. Well, I'm going to take this from the inside. Start bringing it inside, or? Uh, yeah. Unplug them, I'll take care of them there. Finish the video, huh? 